Ladies and gentlemen, um, in many ways, the sports world is the world of our modern day mythology. And there are certain well-worn ways that sports journalists play into that. For example, you tune into game one of the NBA Finals, and in the intro we see a shot like this. The rays of the sun shine in soft focus through uh, a net on an empty court in the middle of, uh, uh, of an inner city or a vast farmland, and there's, we get the string music, and then there's the, the voiceover, maybe it's Bob Costas saying, it begins on the playgrounds of our youth. <laughs> or, or you might you know, get the, a similar feeling uh, reading someone like uh, Frank DeFord, who treats sports figures like characters on a Shakespearean stage, using them to draw grand, grand conclusions about the human condition. John Feinstein has spent much of his career eschewing all that. Don't get me wrong, he doesn't diminish uh, what people do on the fields of play, not at all. W but what Feinstein does is humanize his subjects. He reminds us that they're not deities after all, but living, breathing people with uh, people with immense talent and drive, but also with flaws and insecurities, feeling struggles and complexities. Well, uh, some of the PR-driven mythology uh, surrounding the greats in the game doesn't always withstand the intense light of John's uh, journalism. Sometimes when he shows us their on-the-field achievements uh, in light of their humanity, it, it reveals them to be even more heroic. Read his pieces on Steve Kerr, Jim Valvano, members of the Army-Navy football teams, to name a few, and you'll see what I mean. John Feinstein is the author of more than two dozen books, including two of the biggest selling nonfiction titles in uh, sports titles in publishing history, A Season on the Brink and A Good Walk Spoiled. Next month, he will be inducted into the National Sports Writers and Sportscasters Hall of Fame. That deserves a round of applause. This is his second time at our festival. We certainly hope he'll be back again and again. Please welcome John Feinstein. Thank you, Judd. Thank you for that generous uh, introduction. You, you, it's just like I wrote it, I appreciate it. Um, it's, uh, am I talking into the microphone? Can everybody hear me? Oh, okay. Um, it's great to be back at the Gaithersburg Book Festival. I had the pleasure of being here uh, the first year uh, that it was held two years ago. And, uh, and I'm delighted to see all these people out here on a beautiful day. And thank you all for coming in and not going to get an autograph from Jim Lehrer at this moment. So <laughs> I'm appreciative of all of you who are here. Uh, isn't it great to be living in an area where arguably the most prominent American of the 21st century is just a few miles away, Robert Griffin III. I mean, <laughs> as an Obama supporter, I'm just glad he's not running against Griffin uh, in November. Um, but the, the, there are three books, as Judd mentioned, that I'm going to talk about here in no particular order, but I'm glad to see we have a mixed audience here. We have kids, we have old people like my friend Tom O'Toole from USA Today. Um, and, and many others. But the three books are Season on the Brink, which as Judd mentioned was my first book. It came out 25 years ago. I wrote it when I was 12. Um, one on One, which is my most recent book, which is actually keyed to the 25th anniversary of Season on the Brink. And Rush for the Gold, which as Judd mentioned is coming out uh, this week. It's the sixth in a series of, of kids' mysteries I started writing a few years ago. And, uh, th there's a story behind how I came to write th those books. And uh, when you have kids of your own, and many of you in here clearly do, uh, often you read with your children. And I did that with my oldest child, Danny, who's now 18, taller than me, and refuses to speak to me most of the time. But uh, back when he was several years younger and did speak to me, uh, we were reading the Harry Potter books together. And as he got a little bit older, we read a book called Hoot, which is written by Carl Hyacin. How many of you here have, know about Hoot? It was eventually made into a movie. Uh, Carl Hyacin's one of the great fiction writers of our time. And by, uh, by luck, uh, Carl Hyacin and I are represented by the same agent, Esther Newberg, in New York City. And I wanted to drop Carl a note to tell him how much Danny and I had enjoyed the book. So I called Esther's number and her assistant at the time, 
uh, Christine Bauck answered the phone and gave me Carl's email and said to me, uh, have you ever thought about writing children's books? You tell stories about your kids all the time. I had two at the time. Uh, and uh, why would you consider doing that in the sports genre? And I thought, wow, that might be fun. So I came up with this idea to write a book uh, that set at the final four. It was called Last Shot. And two kid writers, two teenagers, win a writing contest that actually exists. They go to the final four, they stumble across a mystery, and they end up solving it together. Now, six books later, the following has happened. Uh, Last Shot won the Edgar Allan Poe Award for Mystery Writing, which was a great thrill. Uh, I married Christine Bauck, and we have an 18-month-old child together. So writing kids' mysteries can really be a good thing. Um, so I, I'll talk about Rush for the Gold a little bit later, but I think a lot of people uh, often wonder about how Season on the Brink came about. And when I, when I started to write one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to go back and see a lot of the people that I've dealt with through the years in various books, uh, many of whom I hadn't seen for years. I wanted to run down some of the characters from Season on the Brink, and in my mind, the book was always going to end with me going to talk to Bob Knight 25 years after the book came out. Now, some of you would probably know O'Toole's heard me tell this story, but I'll, when Season on the Brink came out, uh, Bob Knight wasn't happy with it. And the irony of it is most of the time as a reporter, you get in trouble because you, somebody says, well, the story's not true. You didn't quote me accurately. In this case, Bob Knight was unhappy because I quoted him too accurately. Uh, there are certain words he uses often, uh, his favorite of which rhymes with duck and luck, uh, that appeared in the book, and he was not happy about this. So at one point he was asked by one reporter uh, uh, what he thought of me, and he said that I was a pimp. And at another point he was asked by another reporter what, what he thought of me, he said I was a whore, excuse the language, but it's true. And I was asked on, 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 I was interviewed on NBC about this whole controversy because I was banned from covering a game at Indiana. And Ahmad Rashad said, you know, Coach Knight has called you these names. How do you respond? I said, I wish he'd make up his mind so I'd know how to dress in the morning. <laughs> uh, it's an issue, what can I tell you? Um, the book ended up, as Judd mentioned, becoming a number one bestseller and launched me, allowed me to go on and keep writing the books that I've been writing for these last 25 years. Eight years later, uh, I was in Hawaii covering Maryland in a, in a, in a tournament out there, because somebody had to go, I volunteered. And uh, I was walking back into the hotel after a game with Gary Williams, the now retired Maryland basketball coach, very laid back, as I'm sure all of you from around here know. Uh, and Gary and I, as we're walking into the hotel, we see Knight and a friend of his walking this way, we're walking that way. And Gary says, uh-oh, here we go. And uh, much to my surprise, Knight turns around and he says, hey, John, hey, Gary, how's it going? And he starts talking as if, you know, we last talked at lunchtime, as opposed to eight years earlier. Is that my cue, Judd? Do I have to get off the train? Uh, so uh, after we'd spoken for several minutes, we walked away, and Gary said to me, after all the things he said about you, why would you even speak to him? I said, because he built my house. And on that note, um, so that was season, that season on the brink, as I said, allowed me to go on and, and keep writing books. And I wrote a book called The Season Inside, which was really on a year in college basketball. I spent a lot of time with people like Mike Krzyzewski, and Jim Valvano, and Dean Smith, and as Judd mentioned, Steve Kerr, uh, and many others, Larry Brown, Danny Manning, and became close to many of them. And most of you here, how many of you here are Maryland fans? Okay. So you all hate Mike Krzyzewski, right? With a passion. And Duke gets every call, right? Every call, they get every call, okay. When I first knew Mike Krzyzewski, Duke couldn't beat anybody, all right? His, Second year, Duke was 10 and 17. His third year, Duke was 11 and 17. They ended the season losing to Virginia in the ACC tournament 109 to 66. Think about that score for a second. So now, Krzyzewski's job is in jeopardy. He's been at Duke for three years. He's 38 and 47. He's got Dean Smith, who just won the national championship at, at North Carolina uh, on his left. He's got Jim Valvano, 
who was about to go win a national championship on his right at NC State. So things were not looking particularly good. Uh, and in fact, this is what it was like for Krzyzewski to recruit in North Carolina, or against North Carolina, excuse me. He went out to recruit a kid from California named Mark Akers. And of course, Dean Smith, as I said, had Michael Jordan, he had James Worthy, he had Sam Perkins, and he was going to win the national championship. He was God in the state of North Carolina. So Krzyzewski's in the home of this kid, Mark Akers. And as a coach, you know sometimes when a visit's not going well, and this was one of those nights. But he had to go through with the ritual, so he kept talking about Duke and why it would be great for Mark to come to Duke. And Mark Akers' mother never said a word the whole time. So finally he looks at her and he says, Mrs. Akers, is there anything you'd like to know about Duke, anything about our academics, how Mark would fit in, what it would be like? She says, no, 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 I don't need to ask any questions because the only thing that's important is that Mark go to college somewhere where he'll be close to God. And Krzyzewski says, well, you know, if he comes to Duke, God will be coaching 10 miles down the road in Chapel Hill. <laughs> Didn't get him. He went to Oral Roberts. It was <laughs> worth the effort. But now in, this, in March of 1983, after losing 109 to 66 to Virginia in the ACC tournament, Mike Krzyzewski is in a Denny's in Atlanta at 2 o'clock in the morning. He's there with one of his assistant coaches, Bobby Dwyer, his sports information, Tom Mickle, and two reporters. One of them was a guy named Keith Drum, who's my best friend who now works for the Sacramento Kings. The other one was me. And we walked in, and we sat down, and the waitress brought us water, and Tom Mickle, the SID, held up his glass, and he said, here's to forgetting tonight. And Krzyzewski held up his glass, and he says, here's to never blanking forgetting tonight. And the next 16 times they played Virginia, they beat him. Now, in 1991, when Duke won the national championship, Krzyzewski's first national title, I was on the court because they let the media on the court when the game's over. And I saw Krzyzewski, and I walked over with my hand out to congratulate him. And he shook hands with me. He says, we've come a long way since the Denny's, haven't we? So he didn't forget. He remembered that night vividly. And when I was working on one-on-one, -on -one, I went down to spend the day with him. One of the things I tried to do, as I said, was go back to see people I'd spend time with. Went down to spend the day with him on the day that he was going to go past Dean Smith on the all-time wins list. Now, the irony of that story for me was that the very first time I met Krzyzewski and Jim Valvano was when I was a college senior uh, in New York City. I, I, Duke was playing Connecticut in Madison Square Garden. And to show you how different times were back then, Duke and Connecticut was the preliminary game. Fordham and Rutgers was the feature game. I'm not making that up. And we went to a lunch. Bill Foster was the Duke coach. And Jim Valvano had played for Bill Foster at Rutgers. So when the luncheon was over, he came over to introduce Coach Foster to his friend, this guy who coached at Army, named Mike Krzyzewski. So I met Mike Krzyzewski and Jim Valvano at the same moment. And Coach Foster said to them, you know, John does a very good Dean Smith imitation. In North Carolina, everybody did a Dean Smith imitation. All right? So Valvano says, oh, do it, do it. And I said, no, 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 it's not that good. And he says, oh, come on, go ahead and do it. It's not like any of us are ever going to win as many games as Dean. So I remembered that on the night that Krzyzewski was going to go past Dean. But I, I called him and I said, I want to spend the day. He said, fine, come on down. I'll meet you at Cameron Indoor Stadium. And they were playing in Greensboro. He said, ride the bus down with us to the game and we can talk on the bus, and then we can talk in the locker room before the game starts. So I said, great. So I was having lunch with his, one of his PR people that day, and he said to me, when are you talking to Coach K? Because you know, his name isn't Mike Krzyzewski anymore. It's Coach K. That's his actual legal name now, I think. <laughs> so when are, you, when are you talking to Coach K? And I said, well, I'm gonna talk to him on the bus, going to Greensboro. And he says, are you gonna talk to him by cell phone on the bus? I said, no, I'm going to talk to him sitting in the next seat on the bus. He says, oh, no, you're not. That's impossible. Nobody rides the bus except the, t the players and the coaches. I said, OK, Mike said, meet me at Cameron. We'll ride the bus together to Greensboro. What part of that did I get wrong? And he goes, it's impossible. There's no way he's letting you on the bus. And I said, well, he is. And he said, why? Why would he let you on the bus? And I said, because I was in the Denny's. <laughs> okay. I actually inserted another word in there. but. In the interest of the older people in the crowd, I won't use it. Um, I, as I said, I, I've had the remarkable luck to know some of the really great and interesting athletes of the last 
25, 30 years in sports. Now, when I covered tennis, which I did for a number of years when I was still full-time at the Washington Post, uh, there were real characters in the game. John McEnroe, Jimmy Connors, Yvonne Lendl, uh, Bjorn Borg, Chris Everett, Martina Navratilova, Steffi Graf, on and on and on. Covering tennis was never easy because it was hard to get access to the athletes, but I won't get on that soapbox today. But of, of all the guys I met, I was probably closest to John McEnroe, which in many ways made sense. Uh, we were both from New York. We're both left-handed. Uh, we both have a little bit of a temper. And one of us was a good tennis player. <laughs> but um, I spent a lot of time with McEnroe. And uh, one night, late in his career, we were in a hotel room. I was working on a magazine piece on him. And I said, looking back, do you have any regrets? And he said, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I wish I hadn't gotten on the umpires as much as I did. I, I, I really, I shouldn't have done that. And I said, yeah, because, you know, 95% of the time, they got the call right. He said, no, they didn't. <laughs> they were always wrong. I just shouldn't have wasted my energy arguing with them. And he, he meant that. He, he, really, he believed he got every single call right. Now, the irony is that Yvonne Lendl and I fought like cats when, when I was covering him. I was a McEnroe guy. You were either a McEnroe guy or a Lendl guy. I was not a Lendl guy. And I was kind of tough on him. I called him a choking dog once. Uh, and I, you know, I made fun of him when he skipped Wimbledon one year because he said he was allergic to grass and went and played golf. Um, <laughs> true story. Uh, and so Lendl was playing here in Washington uh, one time in, in the uh, whatever they call it now tournament that they play down in Rock Creek Park. It's had about 47 different corporate sponsors through the years. But uh, he, he played a match against Jimmy Connors and in the third set he got really upset and he smashed his racket on the court. And he ends up winning the match, and after the match, somebody said to him, Yvonne, what happened there in the third set when you smashed your record? He said, well, I figured no matter what I do, John Feinstein's going to rip me, so I might as well smash my racket. <laughs> so I, I, I was a little bit taken aback by that. And he looks at me and he says, I don't deserve the crap you write about me. He used another word. Um, and so I said, Yvonne, I, I, I'm very sorry to hear that. And we really kind of had a confrontation at that point. And but he ended up forgiving me, largely because that same year, I was detained by the secret police in his former country, Czechoslovakia. Uh, and the short version of the story is that I was over there covering the Federation Cup, which is the women's version of the Davis Cup. It was Martina Navratilova's first time back in Czechoslovakia uh, since she had uh, defected in 1973. And so I was there. A lot of the bigger papers covered her return. And while I was there, a, player, a hockey player named Michael Pavanka, now if any of you are Caps fans, you probably remember Michael Pavanka, defected. And my boss, George Solomon, who was the sports editor at the Washington Post for 28 years, called me and he says, look, you know, as long as you're there, why don't you check out Pavanka, see what you can find out. I said, George, you don't understand. This isn't like the Caps just made a trade with the Blackhawks. And you call the GM and you say, so what about Pavanka? I'm behind the Iron Curtain. And back then, it was 1986, there was an Iron Curtain. He says, well, see what you can find out. Well, to make a long story short, a, a writer who spoke Czech and I bribed a cabbie. We drove out to Klodno, the town where Pavanka lived, and we found his mother in the factory where she worked. I'm, I, I don't even remember how we did, but we did. And we went back to the apartment where they lived. And honestly, the, the apartment, which was for Michael, his parents, and his sister, went from about here to about there. I mean, it was tiny. And we sat and we talked. She spoke some English. My friend translated for a while. And to, just to go back for a second, I had been in Moscow just before this occurred, covering the Goodwill Games. And I got in trouble there uh, because I wrote a story referring to the Goodwill Games as the Ill Will Games because Carl Lewis was complaining, saying that Ben Johnson was using steroids, which as it turns out he was. Uh, and there was this controversy with a uh, Soviet uh, pole vaulter named Sergei Bubka, who the American pole vaulter said was using steroids. It turned out he wasn't. But the uh, Pravda actually wrote a story about the Goodwill Games in which it said the two bad guys in the Goodwill Games were George Shultz, the Secretary of State, who wouldn't let American boxers in the military take part, and me. So I wasn't very popular in the Soviet Union. Now I'm in Czechoslovakia. I'm sitting in this apartment with Michael Pavanka's mother. There's a knock on the door. 
and there's a guy in a suit. And I said to my friend, as he comes into the apartment, who's that? He says, check KGB. And I said, well, to, to quote my mother, oy vey. Um, so he comes in, he demands to see my papers, passport, visa, all these things. And he starts, speaks very good English, questioning me about, you know, what are you doing here? Who authorized you to be here? And I'm playing dumb, which isn't that hard. I said, gee, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be here. I'm really sorry, you know. I, gosh, I didn't think it was that big a deal. So I was detained for four hours. And eventually they let me go, and I went back to the, uh, to the uh, press center, and I called back to the paper to let them know what had happened. And George Solomon said, look, go to the embassy, tell them what happened, and ask them what to do. And I said, okay, but if I have to leave the country, why don't I go to Paris? Because the Tour de France is ending there on Sunday. And George says, John, don't go to Paris. And I said, why not? It's the Tour de France. I can go. I can cover it. He says, John, we still have diplomatic relations with France. Don't go to Paris. <laughs> I didn't go to Paris. Uh, a, a, a really nice man uh, in, in the embassy actually helped me get through the airport. Uh, and it, it's in the book, but the, 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 the bottom line on the story is I ended up getting out of Prague because Martina Navratilova convinced the Lufthansa pilots to stall long enough so that I could catch the plane. So if not for Martina, I might still be in Prague, which is a beautiful city, by the way. Um, I, I get asked a lot about Tiger Woods. And you can't cover golf and not talk about Tiger Woods, write about Tiger Woods. He was the most iconic figure in sports until November 27, 2009. He's now the most iconic and polarizing figure in sports. He is still just as big a name and just as big a deal in sports as he has ever been. Uh, but he's controversial now, whereas before the accident, he wasn't controversial. And I've actually first got to know Tiger uh, when he first came on tour in 1996. And my most vivid memory of early Tiger was being at a tournament in Florida. And Tiger was playing in front of a group that included my friend Paul Goidos, who I write about in every book I write, just because I can't explain it. He's Paul Goidos. Um, and Paul walks up to me in the locker room after he played behind Tiger one day. Tiger was 20 at the time. And he says, you guys, being the media, are always saying, who's the best player in the world who's never won a major? I'm going to tell you who it is. It's Tiger Woods. Because he's the best player in the world, period. And of course, he had just turned pro, so he hadn't even played in a major as a pro yet. And he ended up winning the Masters the next year by 12 shots. And that's when Tiger Mania began. It also was when I started getting his father upset with me because I compared him to Stefano Capriati, the father of Jennifer Capriati. Long story, it's in the book. Um, I'm running out of time here because I know we want to do some Q&A, uh, but I, I will say that in one-on-one, -on -one, there's a long chapter about a dinner I had one night with Tiger and what I learned during that dinner and how it stays with me even to this day as I write about him and talk about him. Because I, people often say to me, you don't like Tiger. And I say, no, I don't dislike Tiger. I feel sorry for Tiger. I think he's a victim of his, of his father. And I think the way his father raised him is the reason why he's such an unhappy person, much like Bob Knight is an unhappy person, but for entirely different reasons. I will wrap up with this quick story, and then I'll take any questions that you guys might want, want to ask uh, from here. Um, I thought this book, One on One, would end, as I said, with me going to talk to Bob Knight, or not talk to Bob Knight. And, it, and I did, in fact, go to talk to Bob Knight. And not surprisingly, because this is who Bob is, even though we quote unquote made up once upon a time, when I told him what I was doing, he, he basically said no, turned around and walked away from me. And my final words to him were, Bob, that's fine, but if you don't like this book, don't complain to me, because I gave you your shot to talk in any language you chose to speak in. But the book does not end there. The book ends with a story about some of the kids I covered at Army and Navy. I wrote a book called The Civil War 17 years ago. It's about the Army-Navy football rivalry. It's about the young men who play football at Army and Navy, who I think are unique, because none of them are going to play in the NFL. Roger Staubach was a once-in-a-generation player. Every now and then, you'll see a player getting a shot but for the most part, 99.9% .9 of the time, the only uniform these guys are going to wear when they graduate 
is an Army uniform, a Navy uniform, or a Marine uniform. Uh, many of the young men that, that I wrote about in this book have served overseas. Uh, one of them died overseas. Uh, most of them, the rest of them, thank God, came back. But there is a camaraderie and there are bonds between these guys that are, I think, unique in sports because of what they go through together and where they're going potentially together. And if, if have any of you here been to an Army-Navy game? Just a few of you. But I know if you've been there, when you see those teams standing together for the playing of the alma maters at the end of the game and you realize what they're going to go on to do, there's nothing like it in sports. Uh, I always call it the five best minutes of the year in sports. And the last chapter of the book is about a real tragedy that occurred in the lives of one of the players, Derek Klein. Uh, his wife, who had been dealing with uh, depression for years, uh, committed suicide. And uh, I knew Derek and I knew his wife very well. They had three beautiful young children and I got a phone call from Derek's best friend, Jim Cantaloupe, who was the captain of the Army team in 1995. Uh, it was January 21st, 2010. And Jim called, I was actually ironically up at Army for a basketball game and told me what had happened. This was at five o'clock at night and Christina had, had died that morning. And I, I was of course stunned and the next thing Jim said to me was, John, there are 12 Army football players in Derek's living room right now. Because all of them, when they heard what happened, had dropped whatever they were doing in their lives and had gotten on airplanes and flown to Dallas, where Derek lived, to be there with their teammate. Now this is 15 years after they all graduated. Most of them are out of the Army now. That weekend, when they had a memorial service for Derek, every member of the senior class who played football was in Dallas to be with Derek. And one of the great support groups he has had since that time has come from the senior class at Navy that year. Because the Navy football players, when they heard what happened, reached out to Derek and said, anything we can do. Because there is that unique bond. And when I, f I, when I finished writing that last chapter of the book, as I wrote it, and I, honestly, I was crying as I did. Uh, I, I thought back the, over 25 years how lucky I've been to know the people that I've known, whether it's Derek Klein and the guys who play football at Army and Navy, or whether it was Bob Knight for all of the ups and downs, or John McEnroe, or Mike Krzyzewski, or Jim Valvano, or Dean Smith, or Tiger Woods. And I often think to myself as I'm working, as I'm traveling, because traveling when you have three kids isn't the easiest thing in the world, but I often remind myself that I get paid to do what most people would pay to do. So I consider myself extraordinarily lucky. One-on-one uh, -on -one's the 28th book I've written. Rush for the Gold's the 29th. Uh, and I hope I'll get to write a whole bunch more. And I'm really grateful to all of you for coming out today. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> it already happened. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm, uh, here's why I'm opposed to expanding the NCAA basketball field. 64 was the perfect number uh, because it worked out in terms of everybody playing six games. It worked out in terms of seeding four regions from 1 to 16. And it also meant that getting in had meaning. Now, I had a, an argument with Gary Williams about this. It, uh, lat two years ago, when they were talking about expanding 96, Gary and I were sitting in a room after Maryland had lost in the ACC tournament to Georgia Tech. So he probably wasn't in the best of moods to begin with. And uh, I said something about, well, you'll still be a number four or five seed because Maryland had tied with Duke for the ACC regular season title that year, had a very good season. You might remember that horrible moment when the kid from Michigan State hit the shot in the second round. Or Maryland, I believe, could have been in the Final Four that year. Uh, but as we're sitting there, he, Gary, because I had written, as you noted, uh, uh, against the expansion. He says, you know, anti-expansionists like you, now I've been called a lot of things, that was the first time I was called an anti-expansionist, don't understand how much it means to these guys to play in the tournament. Years from now, they'll talk about playing in the tournament. I said, that's right, Gary, because it means something. You have to be good to get in. If you expand to 96 and you've got the 14th place team in the Big East playing in the tournament, what does it mean? And, of course, the expansion wouldn't happen in order to make the competition better or so that the kids can talk about it 50 years from now. It would happen why. So the NCAA, you got it, of course. You know, 37-letter word, money. Um, so 
I, I hope it never happens, it will. Just as all these bad things that happen, just as all these conference jumping things that are going on happen. I mean, can you imagine Missouri and Kansas not playing football and basketball anymore? Oklahoma and Nebraska not playing football. I, you know, Syracuse and Pittsburgh, particularly Syracuse, not being in the Big East. The ACC tournament in New York City? I mean, are you kidding me? But it's all happened. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, when am I going to update my blog? Very good question. Um, I hope soon. I started doing a, a daily radio show the first week in March. It's on Sirius XM, uh, Channel 86, if anybody's interested. It's on from 10 to 2 every day. And that's made my schedule just brutally hectic. I just finished another kid's mystery about two weeks ago. Uh, I, you know, I, I have the work that I do for the Washington Post, Golf Channel. I'm researching a book right now on minor league baseball, so I hope I'll get back to the blog very soon. Yes? Your three-year-old's doing well. She's a champ. Right. Well, television has the money, and, and ESPN in particular has become the dominant force in sports television. I mean, there's no getting around that. Uh, if you want to look back at landmark moments in the history of sports, you have to look at 1979. And, and it's the start of ESPN. Uh, and, and the Big East started that year too, which was the true, first true television league. It was built on TV markets. And uh, all of these changes, this realignment that we're seeing, is why? To get more television money. The conferences all want to get stronger so they'll get bigger TV contracts, because that's particularly in football, because that's where the money is. And yeah, ESPN controls a lot. I thought one of the most telling statements uh, that we've seen in years came from the athletic director at Boston College after the recent expansion when Syracuse and Pittsburgh went from the Big East to the ACC when he said ESPN suggested this to us. Now he backpedaled on it later but you know the first thing you say is always the truth and the fact what happened was the Big East turned down an offer from ESPN for to renew a TV deal. The ESPN controlled the ACC rights for years so they're saying, strengthen the ACC, weaken the Big East. We'll still get the Big East. We'll pay them less money. So you're right. E ESPN controls a lot of what goes on in sports. And you know what? It's not changing anytime soon. Boise State in the Big East. I mean, you know, that's perfect geography. What could make more sense? I can't wait until the Boise State women's field hockey team has to drive to Rutgers for a game. I mean, it'll be fabulous. Yes, sir. What the hell happened to me? <laughs> um, that's a great question. Uh, if people didn't hear, my dad was involved in the performing arts, and I write about this in one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and he worked for Saul Hirok, who was a major impresario, ran the Kennedy Center and then the Washington Opera. And uh, people have always wondered, how does someone from the background I came from end up being such a jock? And I'm not completely sure. But the thing that my dad passed on to me was passion. He was extraordinarily passionate about what he did. He loved his work. He lived his work. Uh, he was very close to the artists that he worked with. Uh, they respected his opinions to the point where if he said, I mean, I can remember sitting in our, our apartment in Manhattan when I was growing up and listening to him discuss with Isaac Stern what he should play at a concert and what he shouldn't play. And Isaac Stern would listen to my dad. He respected him that much. And 
I think what my dad passed on to me was that passion. I just have, have channeled it into sports as opposed to into music. I, I love uh, the performing arts. I love Broadway theater. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to go so far as to say I love opera. I love some opera. I lo I've always loved the ballet since I was a kid. So I, I, I'm very lucky that I, I got all of that from him. There is one story I do tell in the book about my dad made me go to see Hamlet when I was 13. Uh, and it was an old Vic production. The old Vic is now the Royal Shakespeare Company. And the, the star was a guy named Richard Pasco. And th the, the whole thing blew me away. Just blew me away. I hadn't seen anything like it in my life. And I got home. I went to bed that night. And about 1 o'clock in the morning, my father came into my room, woke me up, and said, what did you think of the Hamlet? I said, Dad, it was unbelievable. It was, the guy who played Hamlet was just incredible. And my father said, well, he's in the living room. Would you like to come in and meet him? <laughs> And I said, yeah, sure. So I came padding out in my pajamas. And this guy, Richard Pasco, was sitting there. And, and he, my dad introduced me. And his wife was sitting there, who had played Ophelia that night, Barbara Lee Hunt. And so I walked up, over and I said, oh, Mr. Pasco, you were incredible. And I asked him how he made it look like his arm was bleeding when he gets stabbed in the final scene. And he told me he had red toothpaste in his left hand. And he grabs his arm like that. And of course, he's wearing a white shirt. And you see the blood. And, Pretty simple, but for me, I thought that was incredibly cool. So at some point, my mother says, now, John, you know Mrs. Pasco played Ophelia tonight. And I said, yeah, you were fine anyway. <laughs> oh. My dad spent a lot of time in my childhood going like this when I was in the room. But, but that, that, I, I hope that answers your question to some degree. Yes, sir. Any more golf books in the works? I know I will write another golf book. Um, I, I don't know exactly when or what it will be. I would love to spend a year on the nationwide tour. I think that would be great. I think the stories out there are incredible. Uh, that would be a little bit like the Q School book I did. Uh, but there, there are a lot of different books. And I'm sure, wait a minute. I thought it might be Tiger calling to ask me to write his book. But that'll come later. But at some point, yes, there will be. I hope. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, being an old swimmer myself, um, I particularly hate to see that happen. Uh, and again, uh, the pro what bothers me when this happens is that Title IX always gets blamed. And Title IX may be one of the single most important pieces of legislation ever passed in this country. Uh, and it's true. And, and we're coming up on the 40th anniversary next month. And the problem in almost every case is football. We don't need 85 football scholarships. The NFL plays with 53. Now, the reason the college's coaches want 85 is to cover up their mistakes, because not everybody you recruit ends up being a starter. So do the math on this for a second. Most of the major programs redshirt their freshmen. You know, they don't play them for a year. They get an extra year of eligibility. They're allowed to recruit up to 25 guys a year. So that, my, my math's not good, but I know 25 times 5 is 125. I also know that's more than 85. So that means they have to run players off. They have, Nick Saban is famous for saying to guys, you're never going to play here, you better transfer. And they do. So they're spending huge money on football, not just on the scholarship bill, which is tremendous, but on the facilities, because everybody has to build the next great locker room and the next great practice facility, and on the travel, and on the uniforms, and everything else involved. So the reason sports are going down the tubes at Maryland, eight of them altogether, is because of football. And it's not just true at Maryland, it's true all over the country. Yes, young man. Yes, I certainly hope so. Thank you very much, my agent, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, no, thank, yes, I will be doing another one of them. I'm going to probably start on it very soon. So you keep looking for it, OK? And you tell me if you like Rush for the Goal, OK? Anybody else? We got one more? Yes, sir. Sport or at living or dead? <laughs> um, well, the honest answer to that, that question, I have covered Dean Smith extensively. Known him since I was in college. Always wanted to write his biography, his real biography, not the books that have come out in which 
you know, everybody's wonderful, every player was great, uh, every, you know, kid who played for him is a Supreme Court justice. A, a real, because Dean Smith, to me, is one of the most important people uh, in sports in the last 50 years. Not just because he won 879 games, but because uh, people may, and I write about this some in One on One, but he was involved in desegregating restaurants in Chapel Hill in the 50s. Uh, before he was the head coach at North Carolina, he marched against the war, he's marched for nuclear freeze. The lives he's touched with the players he's coached, his father coached the first integrated high school team in Kansas in the 1930s. He's lived an extraordinary life. The sad thing is, I always had a great relationship with Dean, that he's ill now, he, he has dementia. And I started working with him on his biography in 2009 and realized fairly soon that I had gotten to him too late, that he, the memory just wasn't there to tell the stories I needed to tell him. So if I have a singular regret, it's that I didn't get to Coach Smith sooner to do that book. The other person, and I mean it sincerely, if Tiger Woods could ever tell someone the truth, he hasn't told himself the truth yet. And I don't say that as a joke, I mean that. If he could ever tell someone the truth, there's a fascinating story there, and, and in many ways a sad story. But I'm not, again, my cell phone isn't on waiting for the phone call. So thank you all for coming, and uh, enjoy it.